Back in the day, I was terrified of asking girls out on dates. For junior high banquets, I'd have my friends talk to the girls and be kind of a go-between. In high school, generally the girl had to make the first move because I was oblivious when someone was interested in me. So when I saw this beautiful young woman sitting just a few seats away from me in my college history class, I knew I wanted to ask her out, but I had no clue on how I was going to actually do it. I at least knew her name. It was Michelle. Day after day, week after week, I would see her in class, but I couldn't formulate a plan to actually ask her out, let alone talk to her. So I fell back into my old patterns and asked my friends to help me out. One particular friend, John, took up the challenge. Little did I know that this wouldn't go the way that I thought it was gonna go. One evening, John and I were hanging out with some friends in the college gym playing three-on-three -three basketball. We were having fun, working up a good sweat, talking trash to each other, you know, dude stuff. Then it happened. Michelle came into the gym. I saw her. John saw her. She walked past our game and headed downstairs to the weight room. Gotta be honest, it was nice to watch her walk by. But anyway, alas, she had disappeared. So I was like, all right, time to just get back to the game. Nope, John wasn't having it. John looked over at me and gave me a head nod of his, as if to say, dude, go down there and talk to that girl. You know, a, a nod can say a lot. I shook off his sign and nodded back. No, no, no. We, we got our friends. Let's just go play the game. John got the message, but then he did something unexpected. He called over to our friends and said, hey, Chad and I are going to go down to the weight room for a few minutes so he can ask this girl out. You guys cool if, if you hold our spots until we get back? Thanks, John. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Of course, my friends didn't want to miss this opportunity to watch me squirm. So with crazy looking grins, they all said, oh yeah, go for it. <laughs> they really just wanted to see me go down in flames. I mean, that's what friends are for, right? So John and I headed down the stairs into the dungeon to await my fate. I was already sweating from the game, which was good because the nervous sweats wouldn't show up as much. I was freaking out on the inside, of course. On the outside, I was trying to hold it all together and look confident. As we got into the weight room, I surveyed the scene and Michelle was nowhere to be found. Honestly, I was disappointed and relieved all at the same time. I turned to head out the door, but John blocked my path and he pointed to a doorway at the back of the room and said, hey, there's another exercise room back there that we need to check out. Indeed, there was. It was the cardio room, full mostly of exercise bikes, but it also had some mats on the ground for stretching. So we entered the bowels of the dungeon and I again surveyed what was lurking in its depths. No one was in there. At least I thought no one was in there. I noticed movement to my left out of the corner of my eye and I turned to look and there was Michelle stretching out on the mats. She was radiant. I tried to open my mouth in that moment to say hi or something, anything, but nothing came out. She looked up at me and smiled and I totally lost my nerve. I smiled back and then quickly made a beeline for the exercise bike furthest from her and began to ride in self-defeat. I looked over at John, still standing in the doorway, and he was shaking his head as if to say, dude, you are pathetic. He made his way over to me and whispered, man, you're blowing it right now. Just go talk to the girl. I can't do this, man, was my reply. He then leveled up by saying, if you ain't going to talk to her, I will. And with that, he spun around and walked over to Michelle and began a conversation. My anxiety suddenly leaped off the charts. I began pedaling as if I was being chased by a pack of hungry cheetahs, just trying to burn off the fear I was experiencing. A minute or so later, John turned toward me and shouted, Hey, Chad, this bike right here will give you a better workout. You should use this one. And of course, the bike he was motioning to was right next to where Michelle was stretching. So I dismounted my steed and headed over to my new ride. It was indeed going to be a better workout because it had the arms that moved with the pedals. 
because nothing says macho like waving your arms around as you ride a bike. I hopped on him again riding. John gave me a slap on the back and chuckled as he left the room. It was just me and Michelle now. I have to give props to whoever rode that bike before me because they had the tension on the pedals cranked up super high so that every push required all of my power. Of course, I didn't want to look weak in front of my dream girl. So I refused to reduce the tension and just power through it. I was sore for a week as a result. After about five minutes of excruciating exercise, I made up my mind that I had to talk to Michelle. I just needed some sort of opener. I noticed that this bike had a computer readout on it, which gave you the miles that you've ridden, your average speed, calories burned, etc., all this other stuff. I decided to play dumb, and I looked her way and asked if she could help me figure out how to operate the contraption. I mean, surely she'd take pity on me, right? And she did. Michelle popped up from her mat and began quickly instructing me on how to use the device. Now, I have to say, when Michelle is nervous or has had too much coffee, she can talk really fast. So her instructions were something like, if you push this button, you'll get this, and if you push this button, you'll get this. If you push that button, this will happen. If you push that button, this one. But you don't want to push this button because it'll turn off this one. If you turn off this one, it'll turn off this one. And if you turn off that one, this one will happen, this will happen, this will happen. And then she was like, got it? I smiled like I knew what she was talking about and said, uh, thank you? She smiled, grabbed her stuff, and left the room. I felt so pathetic in that moment. You know, as I reflect on this story, I realize that the reason that I actually feared asking her out, and most men or even women fear asking another person out, is that they fear rejection. If the other person says no, what does that say about me? Of course, the enemy likes to heap on for fun, right? I mean, he'll tell you right off the bat, it's because you're a loser. You're not worthy. You're ugly. There's something wrong with you. It's a judgment against us when somebody says no. The fear of rejection is a real thing and it exists in every one of us, even if we won't admit it out loud. Additionally, oftentimes we tend to express interest in others or even we may deem them out of our league. In other words, that person is too attractive, too smart, too popular, too whatever, that they couldn't possibly be interested in someone like me. So we talk ourselves out of even trying to ask them out. We know all of our faults after all. We know our sin, we know our shortcomings, even the ones that we hold inside in our secret. And those things give us hesitation to pursue such a relationship. Even beyond remote romantic relationships, we face the same issue. Imagine forming a relationship, a friendship, with someone who is far out of your league, that it just seems too impossible to happen. I mean, they're perfect in every way. They have riches beyond anything that you could ever imagine. They are super intelligent and run the most complex system in the universe. What could they possibly see in us, in me? How would someone that amazing even be interested in someone messed up like me? Yet, that's exactly what God wants. Yes, he is perfect in every way. And yes, his intelligence can't be measured by any standard. Yes, his wealth is greater than every human's combined for all of history. Yes, he created the universe and everything in it. And yes, he's without sin. But all of that pales in comparison to his desire for an eternal relationship with you and me. Now, last week we talked about the grace of Jesus, that he forgives all of our shortcomings and instead, with a love that can't be comprehended, laid down his life so that we may have freedom from those sins. And when we accept that gift of freedom, we allow Jesus to come into our lives, not as a distant God, but as a personal Savior. That's the way Jesus wants it. In fact, Jesus put it this way in Revelation chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. He says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. How cool is that? I mean, Jesus, the king of the universe, doesn't make us come to him. He comes to us with an invitation of eternal friendship. 
You see, God doesn't see us as beneath him. He doesn't see us as dirty, defiled, evil creatures. He sees us with loving eyes. His desire is to be best friends with you and me. And notice too that this friendship has an amazing benefit. Victory. That victory is over sin. That victory is over death. That victory gives us entry into heaven. Not to some ghetto or shanty town, but into the very presence of God in his throne room. We join Jesus in the presence of the Almighty God for all eternity. Now, of course, this sounds too good to be true. I mean, come on. God really wants a relationship with me? And you may be thinking that that can't be possible because you've done nothing to deserve that. And you're right. None of us deserve it. But that's the point. It's the grace of Jesus that gives us friendship with God. Check out how the Apostle Paul put it in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. He said this, When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we've been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has made us friends of God. How amazing is that truth, family? I mean, Jesus has restored our relationship with God by his sacrifice on the cross. He's also give us, given us something else, righteousness. That word righteousness simply means this. We have right standing with God. In other words, there's no judgment against us. There is no one that is better in God's sight. Instead, he views us all the same without sin. Perfect. It's like this. Growing up, we used to pick teams on the playground. Two captains would stand before the group of us kids and take turns picking the ones that they wanted on their team. Of course, they'd always pick the ones who were the best at the sport that they were going to be playing. And those who were picked toward the end were viewed more as a liability. They weren't really wanted, but everyone wanted to be picked. God forbid you were the last kid picked, because that meant you were the least important of that entire group of kids, the least worthy. I think that system of selection has stuck with many of us and even made it into our view of God. Oftentimes we compare ourselves to other people. Oh, he surely will be accepted by God. He does all the right stuff and never sins, goes to church and all these other things. She will obviously be highly sought out by God because she can lead praise with excellence. She has the voice of an angel. Then there's me. I suck at everything. I mean, God surely won't want me. I and mean, even if he did, it would just be based on pity, nothing else. But these verses that we've just covered destroy that myth. God doesn't play favorites. He isn't looking just for the good kids to play on his team. And by the way, that's also a myth. There's no such thing as someone who is good enough to warrant heaven. God, Jesus, sees us all the same. We're all worthy to be on his team. He isn't looking at our skill set or our abilities. He isn't looking for those who work for the church or can quote the Bible easily. God desires a relationship with everyone, everywhere. To put a finer point on this, you are his favorite. When Jesus died on the cross, he picked you first. You matter to Jesus. You are important to Jesus. Jesus wants you as you are right now. Not after you've proved yourself worthy. Of course, you may be thinking, I have to do something to earn that right. I mean, I've got to make amends for the dumb stuff that I've done to earn the right to be friends with God. Surely that's true. And I've heard that many times before. Jesus had heard that argument before too. In fact, the religious elite, the priests of Jesus' day, were teaching people that they needed to behave perfectly in order to be found acceptable to God. They were wrong. Their belief was that they needed to earn the right to be part of God's family. But Jesus told them something that obliterated their misheld belief. 
In a nutshell, Jesus said, it's not what you do, but who you know, which grants you eternity and gains you entry into heaven. Don't believe me? Well, here it is in Jesus' own words found in Luke chapter 13, verses 23 to 27. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He replied, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom, for many will try to enter but fail. When the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. You'll stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all who do evil. You see, Jesus views that relationship with us as so important that it is the ticket to ever, the everlasting party in heaven. And it makes sense, right? A host gets to invite his friends to a party, to his home. And those that show up uninvited are what we call freeloaders. They're looking for a good time without any ties to the person buying the food. As a result, the door to eternity is guarded by Jesus. Going through the door is actually quite simple. If Jesus knows you because you've accepted him as your savior, then he welcomes you in as a friend, a brother, a sister. And let's make sure we understand this completely. Jesus is the only one who can open the door for you. Your pastor can't, your parents can't, your family can't, your friends can't. Only Jesus has the authority to let you in. To put it in simple terms, Jesus had this to say in John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Notice you can't get into that throne room of God without that relationship with Jesus. Let me ask you this. What's holding you back from that relationship with Jesus? What keeps you from accepting his eternal friendship? He's done everything in his power, even sacrificing his own life, so that you may have right standing with God. Judgment isn't against you. It's in your favor when you are friends with his son, Jesus. Today, Jesus is calling out to you. He's knocking on the door to your heart, to your life right now. He doesn't judge you. He doesn't hate you. He isn't disappointed in you. He wants you on his team. He wants you in his life. Today, accept that grace, accept that invitation and begin your new life with your best friend. And I haven't even told you the best part. I know it's hard to believe, but eternity with Jesus doesn't begin when he returns to take us home to heaven. Eternity begins the moment that you say yes to his invitation for that perfect relationship. Eternity begins now and lasts forever. If you're making that choice today to begin your friendship with your eternal journey with Jesus, please shoot me a message via our website, social media accounts, or my email, which is on the screen right now. Let me have the pleasure of guiding you into the next phase of your life and begin the discussions about baptism, which we talked about last week is that celebration of your new relationship with Jesus. One of the things that I've learned throughout this process is that when you overcome your fear of rejection and you step forward in faith that everything's going to be okay, good things happen. The next day, even though I had ridiculously flamed out and asking Michelle out, I have mustered up the courage to pick up a phone and give her a call. And we talked for a little bit and I eventually asked her out. That call paved the way for an amazing relationship. We've been married now for 22 years. We have two beautiful kids. We've got a crazy Husky dog. We have a home, we have a family. And I've been immensely blessed by having her in my life. If that's taught me anything about relationships, when you see something that wonderful, that beautiful, and the Holy Spirit is pulling you towards it, accept that relationship. Reach out. Jesus will never reject you. He will never push you away. Instead, he will bring you into that great big Jesus hug and welcome you into his life with open arms. Let's pray, family. Well, Heavenly Father, Jesus, we thank you so much for the grace, the mercy, the friendship that you give and extend to each one of us today. 
Lord, there are those that may be wrestling with the question on whether or not to accept that friendship that you offer to them, that eternal relationship, Lord. And I just ask that you knock down all barriers, that you knock down all the excuses, Lord, and instead give them the confidence to reach out and say, yes, I want you in my life from now into eternity, Lord. And when they do that, just flood their life with peace, hope, joy, love, all of the great things that you give, Lord. Wrap your arms around them in that great big Jesus hug that they can feel you, that they can experience you in truly powerful ways, God. Be with us on this amazing day that you've created for each one of us. May we be blessed as we continue to worship and learn more about you and as we fellowship with one another. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.